Okay, so just as a little background, I used to work for this company, Lehman Brothers, and we had a magnificent bankruptcy a few years ago, <laughs> which almost managed to take the whole world down, but it didn't manage to take my life down. I kind of had a good reason to reinvent myself, and I, I really liked my job working with interesting companies, but I didn't like to work for boring big banks, so I decided to set up my own business called Noah, and Noah is like in the biblical way, the survival after a big shitstorm, but also it stands for no assholes here. <laughs> Um, so what, what do I do? Um, I sell complex stories, in simple words, at high prices. That's us, just me and my partner. We used to work at Lehman together. We did a few deals, but that's not so exciting. Probably more exciting for you is our recent deal, which happened in Israel. We sold an Israel classified business to, believe it or not, a German publisher, Axel Springer. Which, which, was, which was not a peace project, but it was a actually wonderful experience. And we had probably around 30 or 40 people interested. And at the end, we had like four or five parties standing. Why do I tell you that? Because I want you to know that classified is probably the most yeah, the most desired segment on the internet. So if you talk to either investors, or strategic buyers, classifieds is the holy grail of what everybody wants. Just to give you some data, so we sold this company for $230 million. They did last year less than $10 million of profits. They have 50% EBITDA margins. They're growing like 20, 30%. So for that, I think we did a good job, and Axel Springer was quite generous. We're also doing a conference, by the way. So I, I realized quite quickly that bankers are not really liked, but conferences are usually what people do like a lot. So I thought, let's camouflage my existence and run a conference, which is an internet conference in, in London. It happens once a year, and we grew our audience quite nicely. So let's come to the, yeah, to the one slide in the presentation, I believe, addresses the the ask of my slot, which is, okay, how shall internet companies, especially classified businesses, make money? And this is a perspective from a banker. It's not a perspective from an operator. And these are all the different models I've seen with clients. And the last one is probably new, and I have seen a lot of people talking about it. I believe you cannot read this. Is this right? So I, I, I rather talk about it. Okay. So when, when we see classified businesses, the easiest monetization is Google AdSense. And Google AdSense used to be these ugly ads, which, as we know from Andy, nobody clicks on. But Google AdSense, or Google now DoubleClick, the display network, changed quite a lot. So we have been working with a lot of companies who use Google to monetize quickly. And surprise, surprise, out of the 50 or even 100 ad networks out there, Google still gives a lot of value. And we benchmarked their CPM rates or CPC rates across the industry. And they're still, in many cases, the highest. And how do they do that? They do it by serving contextual display ads. So Google AdSense or Google Display served through the same um, ad server is a quite reliable, yet not huge, but easy to implement monetization. The next one is display. And remember, Google also sells display. But display advertising is probably the next um, interesting monetization in terms of revenue per user, RPM, which when you say, show me the money, that's how we would uh, benchmark the ability of any website to monetize. So we would take their revenues and their users, and we calculate an RPM revenue per 1,000 users, which gives you an idea on how well a site monetized. So display advertising, you can have in-house, or you can have an agency. Um, 
mandated for it to sell your ads. Yad Stein in Israel, which is like the classified leader, they have like probably 90% market share of originated real estate or auto transactions in the whole country. So they are by far the market leader. Interestingly, they generate 50% of their revenues in display. And these are usually um, real estate developers who take big ads. So although display, as we know from the click-through rates, is not that sexy anymore, in some instances, like for Yad Stein in Israel, it works quite well. And big developers take big display ads on the site, and people do actually click on it. Why? Because it's relevant. So if you're lazy and you have some traffic, go for Google. If you have a good audience and you have targeted uh, users who are looking for very specific content, you can use display advertising quite effectively. I think that some CPM rates these days go up to $100, especially in the financial world. Um, so it's worthwhile checking it. The next model we see is listings, which is a paid, in, paid for inclusion model. So advertisers pay to be included in a, in a result, sometimes ranked on top, sometimes highlighted, and um, there's always, I would say, a, a very interesting question. How do you maximize your revenues by not harming the user experience? So you don't want to have, and, and <laughs> by the way, that there was a bit of a problem in Israel because they sold these premium listings, and they were orange. They looked really ugly. Yeah? So, at some stage, when you do a search for a popular um, area in Tel Aviv for real estate, your entire page was orange. It kind of didn't make any sense for anyone, not for the advertiser and the users were complaining. So you have to really adjust um, to keep listings, the ones which are paid for exclusive, and don't scatter the whole page. So leave value for the user and make it enjoyable to, to search for an auto or for a real estate. So the whole listing model is, is quite delicate and has to be uh, very sensitive in terms of how you price it and how you sell it. There's automated sales versus the sales force or telesales. Um, so you have sometimes feet on the ground to visit the bigger ones, but telesales usually complements with it. And uh, we believe a lot in an automated booking platform where people can go on and actually buy their premium listings without you ever visiting them. And well, then you can visit or call them to upsell. The next model is uh, the CPC model, which you probably know from Google. When somebody advertises on Google and you click on it, Google makes money, whatever, between 20 cents and $5. It's, it's kind of classic. Uh, it's probably of this page for classifieds the biggest revenue stream for 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 um, the industry to come. We are more in the listing space, but we are moving into CPC also because of mobile. In mobile, you have a better ability to track the user, and therefore you have the ability to also go easier to a CPC model. Now you probably know some meta search engines like Tro uh, uh, Trivago, but also Trovit. So these companies aggregate a lot of listings and the listing providers, they don't advertise, they only pay per click, which is different. And they, they are basically getting the user and once they have the user on their side, it's their job to convert and generate more revenues with them. So the portal just sends off the user and gets paid per click. And it, Tri Trivago is an interesting company. I don't know if you have heard of them. They got acquired by Expedia last year for over a billion dollars. Actually, we worked on that deal. And the, the interesting thing was they started with a community, like a bit like Trip Advisors, where they had users rating hotels and writing about them, and nobody really cared. So. They didn't sell any display, they had no uh, Google AdSense, they had hardly made any revenues. So eventually they said, oh, let, let's just start over. And they thought, 
because travel is an oligopolistic market and you have one hotel which like five, at least five uh, different travel agents, OTA, selling this hotel, what it comes down to is price. So they said, okay, the user can go to Expedia, Booking.com, HRS, but we will create value by bundling all these offers and that's why the user will come to me and they will get the cheapest price. So they have done that and <coughs> the, the OTA, the, advertiser, the advertising they paid for was per click. So the user left Trivago to get to those sites. So this is all about clicks. And the next model is CPA. And CPA really stands for uh, cost per action. So you only really pay when there's a transaction. Now, in classifieds, that's kind of hard because you, you cannot prove, usually, your advertiser that you delivered a transaction. You can prove that you send a user to their site, but you can hardly prove that somebody signed at the dotted line. And, and why is that? Well, it's because you're not there when the viewing happened, the real estate viewing or the test drive and you're cut out of the transaction, which is the dilemma, because a real estate agent could make 100,000 euros to deliver somebody who buys a property, while you make, in the listing case, per listing maybe $10 a month, or in the CPC model, you send maybe 20 users for 30 euro cents uh, per click, but the agent makes up to 100,000 commission at a very high property, or let's call it a few thousand dollars. Now, this dilemma I don't think will be fixed. And why Martin Endele was giving a presentation at our conference, he's an old CEO of Scout from Germany, while he gave a presentation moving closer to the transaction, I don't think we can fool ourselves. We won't be able to cut into the pie because we won't be able to prove that there's a transaction. On mobile, there are more ways to monetize, and I think they're developing with huge excitement. And you can organize viewings and get revenues per viewing, and you can do more things because you are mobile. But in the traditional world of desktop, the CPA model in our industry won't work. How does it work in other industries? The insurance industry is doing a great job in that. So companies like Money Supermarket or Check24, they can send the user and then the insurance company finishes the user off and they hope to close the transaction over an hour of a session by, and in the end they enter the credit card. But um, what they usually do is they finish this process on their side themselves. So the insurance is all the 30 questions and 50 questions are answered, and then they actually close the transaction on behalf of their customer. So the insurance companies to the portals are not advertisers. They are simply suppliers, and they became agents. Now, what does that mean for classifieds? Uh, we had a lot of discussions with classified portals if there is a way for them to close a transaction and to compete with their customers. And I, I believe the most prominent example is coming from the job space where Indeed has done that. Indeed is an online recruitment site from the US. They have aggregated all the different search or listings from the portals and they got paid on a CPC model, uh, cost per click when somebody goes to a monster or carrier builder. And they weren't happy with that because they said, well, we kind of have the users. We have 20, 30, 50 million users per month, while these guys have around 5 million, but they make the junk of the revenues while we only get a little cost per click. So they started to compete with their own customers and they went to the customers of their customers so they went to the advertisers on Monster, on Carrier Builder, et cetera, and they said, advertise on us, we have the users. There's no need for you to go to those guys. And why you should come to us? Well, it's price. So they went to a direct model, or we can call it agency model in, in the more traditional classified 
definition of the language. So in the US, Indeed disintermediated their advertisers and went straight to the ones who are actually looking for candidates to fill jobs. And they have done so quite successfully and the revenue grew significantly and they sold also for a billion dollars, I think two years ago to probably the largest classified business of the world, Recruit. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. They're based in Japan and they have more beautiful offices than Goldman Sachs. I think they're ready to go public this year. I've, I visited them in, in Tokyo last year. Um, so the agency model for you or for classified publishers is, is it's quite interesting because we think you can attract in some situations real estate developers or big car dealers uh, to take risk yourself. Why can you do that? Because you know what is the right price to set for a house or an apartment or for a car by having the data and then you can make a bet. I, I will sell your house, your apartment within the next six weeks and I will take not 4% or 3% commission, I will take only half a percent commission. So you, you tip your foot into the water and test and play around with it a little bit. And there are two additional thoughts. One is because you own the site, you can decide how much advertising or how much airtime or real estate you will give to this specific ad where you know you make $4,000 when it goes through while $10 for the listing. So you can manipulate your own success. And second, we do not recommend the agency model unless you are a market leader in your niche or in your country because if you're not, you play a very difficult, dangerous game because you get in trouble with your advertisers. And it's not worth troubling your advertisers when you don't have a strong position because then they go naturally to your competitors. Um, we think there's a lot going to come in, in the last uh, field of monetization and we are excited to see the first models. There are new entrants coming into this like in the US, but I think the safer way is to probably stay in the other five uh, segments Why the CPA is hard. CPC uh, is interesting and is probably a good alternative to listings because just getting a paid for inclusion model um, is, is probably not leverageable because we are now at a stage where classified sites have been around for 15 years. So the audience will grow, but it's not growing as much as it used to. So you need to find ways to grow the dollars and not just the users. So that, that's the way how a banker sees monetization on classifieds. Um, when you talk about monetization and you talk about revenues, you always need to talk about traffic. And what you see here is the number of direct visits in this year, it was we picked January 2014, and we care about direct visits a lot because SEO in the financial world is not valued. Nobody cares about SEO traffic because they think that you're, they're coming to your site just because they were looking for something at that moment. You are not a site they will come back to if you get an SEO user. So what, from a valuation point of view, which comes before the selling, but from a valuation point of view, the direct visitor, the direct user is the only thing which matters. And the reason we got such a high price for the Israel deal was they had 80% of the traffic direct, more or less. And that matters. Now here you have some names and I'm sure the presentation will be made available. By the way, if you look for good traffic sources, I think Andy shared with us a very interesting uh, tool, which was Google Trends, which is searching for concepts, keywords. But if you want to have the domain name audience measurement, which is free and awesome, there is this company called SimilarWeb.com, which gives, I mean, 95% of the cases super reliable data. There are some outliers, but 
Similar web is the only source where you really get data. I mean, there's Alexa, and then there are all these things you pay for, Comscore and net ratings. I don't know if they still exist. But uh, similar web is the source to use and play around with it. It's soon also having mobile data. You can also get keywords there. We, we are big fans of them, as you can see. So um, the orange bit, by the way, is direct to site, and the, the yellow or greenish is uh, mailings. So mailings still work and classifies quite a lot. And especially the aggregators are using it. Uh, Trovid, Job Rapido are aggregators. But uh, don't underestimate email. By the way, email is the only marketing we do for our conference, and it works quite well. Um, so not all traffic is created equal. Here you see um, another benchmark of where traffic is coming from for some famous publishers. And we put in the averages. So when you, in average, are underperform or overperform, uh, maybe you should look into the one or the other source and balance your traffic sources. And they're the ones who don't do offline advertising on the left. Some recently started, like Verivox and Zupla. And then there are the heavy advertisers on the right who do TV advertising. And this TV advertising, you get your direct traffic up. But it's only relevant for really large companies. Um, we like numbers as bankers. So um, here you have some valuation data. And I said at the beginning that classifieds is the most attractive segment on the internet. You can also see this in valuation data. So you have 20 times to 20 or 30 times EBITDA valuations, EBIT meaning profits. Um, here you see some classified deals. The 20 to 30 times is also in here. You saw a big deal in Germany. The Scout, private equity bought that. Um, so Think like 20 to 30 times profits and 10 times revenues in terms of valuation. Here's some more uh, data. We can click through this quickly. <coughs> this is my favorite slide. Um, when we think about valuation and monetization, we always need to think where the business is. And sometimes you just have a management team, and it's worth a lot because they've done it before. The next step is, you have an amazing technology, which no one else has, like Spotify. Spotify became successful because they were fast. They had the fastest technology. So to search was instant. It was like a millisecond you got the search result, like Google, by the way. The next, the next step of the call evaluation chain is the users, the KPIs. Once you have users and KPIs and you have traffic, you're worth more than a technology or just a management team. Then the revenues come and you're able to monetize, which this conference is all about. And then it's not just about revenues, it's actually about profits because you want to have money back once you invest. And just buying revenues, like we have seen in cases like Zalando in Germany, which is an e-commerce player making billions of revenues, but no profits, people ironically or cynically say, well, you just buy revenues, but that's not long lasting because you don't make any gross margin. And at the end, you can't give anything back to your shareholder. And then the holy grail is market leadership. Once you are the leader, people pay a premium, like we saw in Israel with Judge Stein. Um, that's about an M&A slide, like what matters. I'm not going to walk you through it because it's really boring, but important. Um, the valuation is not everything. There are a lot of things coming with it and to, to really also understand in a deal. And this is my lessons learned of Internet M&A. And maybe you can make this available as a handout. Um, bankers always try to sound complicated, but all what we do is common knowledge. And it's basically, hopefully, good judgment. So let's not fool you. Um, a banker's job. Can, done, can be done by everyone else. I guess the one thing which differentiates us is experience and a bit of background. So here are some lessons learned which you can uh, read through at your leisure. I'm happy to take some questions. I believe this was almost my last slide. This is my last slide, but this is uh, just a number of funds. I think on the fund side, maybe 
the investment funds, if you're looking for investors, this looks quite complicated, but it's not. You always need to think about, when you talk to an investor, what is the amount of money they want to invest? Because there's kind of four stages. There are the angel investors who do like 200,000 to a million. Then there are the VCs, they do up to 50 million. That's what they want to invest, 5 million, 10 million. But then there are the gross capital guys and the private equity guys. So when you want to talk to investors, you always need to understand what's the money they want to invest. So you don't want to go to someone who wants to invest 500 million with a 500,000 investment ask and not the other way around. And this chart shows you the equity check size, the money they want to invest ranged by low to high and the reds are the sweet spots. We had a 350 investment funds at our conference last year in London, so we have a bit of everyone. Okay, we'll take some questions. Sorry for rushing That's you. That's not through. a problem. Ladies and gentlemen, Marco Rasek, stay hard. Congratulations. <laughs> questions for Marco? Nobody's going to ask a question? There was two intense. If there's no question, I will be really depressed. The, oh, there's a question. Don't worry. <laughs> How do you look for uh, prospects? Where do you find um, more classified uh, businesses like ours? Yeah, that's just, this is a very quick answer. Similar web. I mean, we love traffic because traffic gives you an indication of revenues and profits. Unless they're really incapable of monetizing, there's always revenues when there's traffic. So we use, we use similar web. Then we check on LinkedIn how many employees they have. They are the corporate pages. And then it's uh, usually uh, word of mouth. So a lot of people come to us. But for us, the bad news is there are not many big ones left which are independent. I think Axel Springer, Shipstead, Naspers, they have done a great job buying up most of them. And it's kind of funny, if you look at M&A, we know all these big studies and surveys that M&A doesn't work. Once a company is bought, they destroy it. Most famous uh, example, Time Warner buying AOL and they killed the company. Or um, IAC, uh, no, no, who was it? Um, Murdoch buying MySpace, yeah, killed the company. In classified, I cannot think of one single deal where the acquisition has not worked. Look at eBay buying Marktplatz in Holland or, I mean, every deal worked and it's a testimony of the strengths of classifieds. Classifieds is the best of the best in internet. It's better than e-commerce, advertising sucks anyway because they're opportunistic and running around. But classifieds, you have the many-to-many -many marketplace, it, it works. So the, the, the way we find the few ones which are left are similar web and word, word of mouth. Burak? Hi. Uh, some of us are pure online players like Saibin, and, and we have uh, quite a few players coming from the print background and now having bought mm -hmm. online and print together. What is uh, your view in terms yeah, of M&A on print and uh, it's plus a, online? It's a great, it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure <laughs> I have to answer. Um, so we have, see, we have a lot of clients we work with who switched off paper. And the, the, the one I know best is Auto Trader in the UK, the Trader Media Group. Um, I think they, they still have it, it just makes 50, like 5% of their revenues. But the question when you switch off paper and how you switch off paper is a very operational question, which I'm probably not the best person to answer. I can just tell you one thing, I have seen people doing it and they have been doing it very successfully. For example, once you switched off the paper, the print, you do not have any corporate conflicts of interest anymore. Yeah, you may lose some revenues and you may risk the whole thing, but um, it, it plays out in the long term. In Israel, by the way, the Yellow Page company, Golden Pages, they switched off paper last year and now their revenues online grow 20%. They only used to grow 5% because they always had kind of this conflict of interest. When should you switch it off? 
I have seen people doing it when they had 60% of the revenues coming from print, so 40% of online. I think as soon as you have like a third of your revenues online, and online is highly profitable, while print isn't, you can switch it off already. Uh, I don't think uh, people should be scared because what one thing is for sure, in order to win the online battle, you need focus. And you cannot focus when you have two, two things to look after. But then there are sometimes even synergies between online and offline. So when you drive online traffic through your print publications, probably not wise to switch off. You see, I have no answer. Uh, I can give you one interesting example of online and offline uh, synergies. You probably have heard of the mail order company Otto. It's a German business. It's the largest mail order group of the world. So they're always uh, claiming to be the second largest global e-commerce business. I think they don't take Alibaba into account, but they only look at Amazon in the West. So they do like 8 billion of revenues online in e-commerce. The problem is they have not switched off print, so they still spend $5 billion a year on printing catalogs. So they said, we are an online business, and they were testing it. In one village in Germany, they switched off the catalog, and they only went with the online offering, and they lost 80% of the online revenues. Why? Because the people in the household, they use the catalog to research products. And the husband is making like crosses or puts a list together and gives it to the wife and say, here, order this. Or the wife says to her husband, order this. So the online is supported by the catalog. So they couldn't switch it off. It's a big problem for them. So you want to make sure before you switch off print, that you don't risk everything and lose everything. But in general, we see a lot of people successfully migrating online, and it's probably the way to go, the future. Ladies thank and gentlemen, much. say thank you to Marco. Well done.